colour in these circles here with two colours, let's say uh, red and blue, in such a way that you never have the same colour joined by one of these lines. Well, how would we go about doing that? We could just start trying to do it. Perhaps we could uh, colour in this node here with red. Once we've coloured this one red, if we've only got red and blue, then this one has to be blue, and this one has to be blue. Once those two are blue, this one has to be red, this one has to be red, this one has to be red. And you can see that actually once you've put in the first colour, everything else is forced. So let me just show you what the result of this uh, analysis is. I can get it to fit. So here was the, uh, the red. It might as well be red. If it was blue, it wouldn't make much difference. It would just swap red and blue around. And so A was the first one we coloured in. Then we were forced to do these two Bs in blue. Then we were forced to do the Cs in red again. And then we were forced to do these three Ds in blue. But once we've done that, we notice that we've got a blue next to a blue. And everything has gone wrong. But because we were forced to do everything that we did, then we were forced to go wrong. In other words, it is impossible to colour in these circles with just two colours in such a way that you never have um, two of the same colour linked to each other. Now that's quite a simple argument as mathematical arguments go and um, what that translates into is that if you want to devise a computer program to solve this problem for you when you say instead of having the 12 uh, nodes that I've got here, say you had a thousand nodes and you'd be rather tedious to go through all this process, you can do it and, um, well, I've written it for 100. If, you, N, if N stands for the number of nodes, then roughly our N squared will be the number of uh, steps that this procedure takes. Um, I'm slightly taking into account that uh, a computer can't just sort of look and see that there's an edge in quite the way that we can. So uh, that's why I've put N squared there. Now let me consider a superficially rather similar problem. In fact, superficially very similar problem because I'm going to put up another of these uh, networks. It's a little bit more complicated, perhaps. Well, can we colour this one with uh, two colours? No, we definitely can't because there's a triangle here and you certainly can't, uh, if you've got this one red, then that has to be blue and that has to be blue and you, you've had it. So it's immediately obvious that you can't colour that one with two colours, but perhaps you could do it with three. Well, how are we going to go about solving that? So the question, can you do it with three colours in such a way that you never have the same colour linked to itself? Well, we could start over here and put that one red, but then what do we do? That one could be blue, or it could be green. What should we do? Well, so far, perhaps we could just say without loss of generality, it's blue. And then here, well, that one could be green, or it could be red. And you can't say without loss of generality anymore, because this one's already red, so it sort of makes a difference, whether it's red or blue, or at least it may make a difference. Now, if you try and do it by this sort of method, what you find is that you may well be able to fill in a few of them, and then somehow you get into trouble over here. You find that you can't uh, put the colours in. To get out of that trouble, it may well be that you can't just take one step back. You have to take sort of several steps back and maybe change something that you did right near the beginning. And it turns out that actually, well, I would like to say with great uh, certainty that uh, there is no way of doing it um, or no sort of quick way of doing it. That's actually an unsolved problem. But there is no known quick way of doing it. What would be a slow way of doing it? A slow way of doing it would be just to try all possible colourings of three things. So every conceivable assignment of red, blue and green to these nodes and just see if you find one that happens to work. Well, I didn't do that actually. Of course, I chose the colours first and then drew the uh, <laughs> network. But uh, it can be done in this particular case. Uh, there is a colouring with red, blue and green and you never have, unless I've made an embarrassing mistake, you never have um, the same colour linked to itself. Now, supposing you had 100 vertices and you did it by the uh, crude method that I described of just checking all possibilities, well, it would take of order 3 to the 100, and then each time you wanted to check it, you've got uh, 100 squared. Actually, I didn't put enough zeros on the end. It's an even bigger number than uh, I've done. There should be two more zeros. Uh, so that is, as I've written it, uh, 3 to the 100 times 100. It should be 3 to the 100 times 10,000. Now, uh, you don't have to be a great expert in computer science to know that if you've got that number of steps, then the uh, calculation is going to take too long. In fact, it would take too long even if you had the whole age of the universe to play with and every single atom of the universe at your service. Uh, it just can't be done.
Now, what do computer scientists say about this? They want to distinguish between step-by-step -step procedures that are practical and step-by-step -step procedures that are not practical. And the convention is the following. If n is the size of the problem, which in this case might be the number of nodes, then a, a, a procedure is practical if it is no worse than a polynomial in n. So a polynomial is some expression like this, 100 n to the 8 plus 73 n to the 6, some expression that looks a bit like that. Then the algorithm or the procedure counts as efficient, and if you can't say that there's some polynomial that uh, gives you a, an upper estimate on how long it takes, then you say that it's inefficient. Now, why is that uh, a good convention? Well, there are sound mathematical reasons for it, which I don't want to go into. What I want to point out here is that from a practical, a strictly practical point of view, it is not a good convention, because if you, e.g., e had 100 uh, vertices and you took this particular polynomial, that is the number of steps you would need, and that is, although not as big as the number I had over there, is still a very, very big, rather impractically large number. So computer scientists, or at least some computer scientists, deal with, with algorithms that you might call practical in theory, but not practical in practice. Now, <laughs> there are, as I say, very, very good reasons for that, and uh, which I don't want to go into, but just to say that you can be working in a, in a practical-seeming area in a rather theoretical way. I don't want to pretend that computer scientists actually think their algorithms are, uh, are practical. Of course, they know the distinction that I've just drawn attention to. So to summarize what I've said so far, most mathematicians, including those who work in useful-sounding branches of mathematics, do not work on problems with direct practical applications. It would be dishonest of me to argue for the importance of mathematics by trying to pretend that this was not so. Instead, my task will be to explain why, despite this fact, mathematics is a worthwhile endeavor and why it should be supported. And I will give two arguments. The first, based on the practical utility of mathematics, despite what I have just said, and the second on its cultural value. Well, it may look as though I've been trying to convince you that mathematics is a useless subject, but in fact, all I have claimed is that a typical mathematician does not actively try to be useful. And these are two very different statements. They're different because there is an important distinction between the collective result of an activity and the individual motives of the participants. Let me give an example of this from outside mathematics. Some capitalist economies are based on the premise that individual greed and selfishness, if I can use somewhat emotive terms, can act for the collective good of society. The greed causes people to strive to become wealthy, and this benefits the entire economy in many ways, such as increasing the tax revenue for the government, which can then be spent on hospitals, schools, public transport, and so on, or causing companies to be set up, which provide livelihoods for many people. The individuals need have absolutely no interest in whether other members of society have satisfactory lives, provided that sufficient social order is maintained, but in an indirect way, their activity does benefit others. Of course, not everybody agrees that economies such as I have briefly described are a good thing, and the last thing I wish to do is to let politics intrude on the mathematical